This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On November the 19th, the Institute hosted a speaker's luncheon with Canadian pollster Dr. Darrell Bricker, CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs, who spoke on the Canadian federal election of October the 21st. Was it a mandate or was it a message? I see there's a new topic, but I suspect the answer to the original topic was yes. Uh, however, without further ado, welcome, Daryl. Welcome sir. back. Th thank you very much, and thanks for the kind words, Eric. And yes, I was here prior to the last election. Uh, how many people were actually here at that session? So pretty close to what we talked about, right? So uh, what ended up happening? Um, so what I would like to do, and by the way, this is a work in progress. I haven't uh, presented this to any, anybody else. I came to my friends at the Royal Canadian Military Institute, where I am a member here, so that uh, requires you to be nice to me. Um, and an, an honorary colonel, I'm wearing my uh, Queen's York Rangers tie today, so uh, uh, this requires you one more reason for you to be nice to me. Uh, so this is a work in, in, in progress, so you can tell me through your questions afterwards how close uh, this comes to your recollection as to what this election was about. Uh, but um, moving on, I'm going to do a quick recap of what uh, we talked about at the last session. I'm going to talk about the election results and, and make sure that uh, we have a good understanding of what actually happened on the ground, because what happens on the ground is what elections are about. I'm going to talk about what next for Canada and where we find ourselves after this election campaign. Where are Canadians and how are they feeling? And finally, a few takeaways as we anticipate the next two or three years of minority government in Canada, uh, what the, uh, uh, the issues uh, that, that, uh, that could dominate the agenda and the trap that the Liberals could potentially be setting for themselves as they, as they move forward. And that's where we get into this question of message or mandate. Every election is about one or the other. Uh, you're either delivering a message uh, as, through the, the process of your vote or you're endorsing some sort of a, sort of a mandate for a particular government, for, for example, a, a very specific set of policies that you want them to deliver on. Uh, as I said at the last uh, presentation, I think after 2015 that the Liberals mistook a message for a mandate and that the question this time around is if they potentially could do the same thing. So a quick recap. Uh, as I mentioned the last time around, and uh, I said this is my cheat cheater's guide to watching an, an election, here's the things that, uh, that you should keep an eye on. First thing is that context matters. What's going on uh, more broadly than just in the political system in a society is incredibly important to determining what happens uh, in the election campaign. How the system operates is incredibly important. So, uh, for example, winning the popular vote does not necessarily win you the election. So understanding the realities of the political system are important. And that we go through cycles. Uh, you know, we were going through a blue cycle at the provincial level, what was going to happen at the federal level, a little undefined at the time, but there seemed to be a certain advantage for the Conservatives in terms of the political cycle. Uh, the primary election question is always change or not. Uh, then the competition after you decided you wanted to change the government is which option is the most acceptable. Uh, we talked about fast versus slow thinking. This is behavioral economics. The idea that people don't walk into an election booth with uh, all of the party platforms, a calculator and a highlighter and come out two hours afterwards after they've gone through and assessed all of the, uh, the calculus around each of the options in the, in the platforms, well, how they're going to vote. Uh, we tend to vote very emotionally. Um, we respond to things quickly. We think quickly. And uh, we have these rules of thumbs called heuristics in terms of how we evaluate uh, the options that we're looking at. We talked a little bit about those. It certainly played a big role in this election campaign. And really, when it comes down to the next uh, comment, as we talked about uh, last time around, it's really about how the leaders make you feel. Are they in harmony with the prevailing mood? Do you get the right feeling from them? And this was very much a leadership election and was decided on the basis of leadership and what you felt about the leaders. You need to find an issue and you need to make it your own. Uh, parties that are in good shape and win elections are the ones that are aligned with the prevailing mood. They drive the election with, uh, with the issues that they decide to focus on. 
Uh, and as we talked about, and we saw definitely in this election campaign, there is no national election. There's a series of regional, provincial, and sub-provincial elections that are fought on the, a different basis every place, every place that you go. It's about seats. It's not about the percentage of votes. Uh, who has the most efficient vote, wins the most seats with the fewest votes, tends to have a real advantage in the election campaign, and boy did we see that this time. Finally, as I said before, message or mandate. I would argue that uh, what was being sent in this election campaign was more a message than it was delivering on a mandate, but was it a message about the Prime Minister or the Leader of the Opposition? That's what we have yet to figure out. I said at the time, this is going to be a competitive election, and SNC-Lavalin made it more competitive. The Liberals were going to win in a walk, and because of their own self-inflicted wounds, they ended up in a very uh, competitive election campaign, campaign. The context, was it a change election or not? It looked to be a change election, but risk became associated with change. So it was very much a, a, a change-oriented election, but people, and I'll show you the data on this, held their nose at the very end. Short-term economic confidence was wobbly, and this was a, uh, a big disadvantage for the government going into the campaign. There was a general sense in Canada, and I'll show you some more data on this again, post-election data, Canadians feeling this lack of progress, the sense that the social progress that we've been going through, the economic progress that we've been going through in Canada has stopped and has started to decline. And this is a long-term trend. Uh, the misalignment of the Liberals and public priorities, they spent an awful lot of time talking about identity issues, Aboriginal issues, environmental issues, things that the public really wasn't talking about very much prior to the election campaign. They were more focused on the economy than the government was. There was blue momentum at the provincial level, and the NDP was weak, as, uh, as they ended up being on election night. I've never seen a, somebody so happy in my life to do so poorly. Um, the fragmentation of progressives, there's more progressive voters, as I said in the, on uh, my last presentation, in Canada than there are conservative voters. Conservatives win when the progressives are fragmented. I talked about what the Liberals, Conservatives, and the NDP strategy would be. This is the slide I actually presented to you in April. Actually, all the other slides I presented to you in April, too. Uh, I said that the Liberals were going to shift left, they were going to pull the middle along, their campaign was to marginalize the NDP by demonizing the Conservatives. Is that what they did? Absolutely, that's what they did. Uh, their focus was going to be on climate change and identity. Uh, both issues played very big in the campaign. And finally, uh, their geographic challenge was to grow in BC, which they failed at, to hold on to the, on to the 905, which they did very well at, and to grow in Quebec. They declined a little bit, but not enough. The Conservatives, their focus was going to be on failure, hypocrisy, elitism, poor management, taxing and spending, uh, and the carbon tax in particular. Uh, the government's failure to deliver on a whole series of promises that they made in 2015, obviously SNC and other issues they've been dealing with. They were going to announce no big plans, and they really did announce no big plans. Uh, their focus of their campaign really had to be to steal the 905, find a place in Quebec, and interestingly, the Conservatives only won one fewer seat in Quebec this time than they did the last time. And they needed to make some progress in Atlantic Canada, which they did. One part of that equation they failed on, which was doing well in the 905. The NDP, the only role that they were going to play was to be as spoilers. Their campaign really had to be focused on getting progressives back from the Liberals. Climate change, pipeline hypocrisy, they had to do better in BC and Ontario, which they actually did a little better in those two places. And they had to tack hard left, which is exactly what Jagmeet Singh did. Uh, and um, as I said before, uh, failed in what he needed to do in the election campaign, but seems not to have figured it out. Uh, the one party I didn't have up here, uh, I never thought the Green Party was going to do anything, by the way. I always thought they, uh, uh, they always pull way better than they perform. Uh, um, and uh, their strategy was basically the NDP strategy. Uh, and then the Bloc Québécois, which at the time I had uh, said, I don't remember exactly what I said because I was saying it to everybody at the time, anybody who thinks that an NDP voter in 2015 was a, a left-wing voter in the province of Quebec, you need to adjust what you think. These are people who are more accessible. They're parked Bloc, Bloc Québécois voters. They could go to the Bloc or they could go to the Conservatives. They went to the Bloc. 
And I pointed out one other party, and I'll just, what I was going to say was that, um, let's see if I can find the last document, was that uh, uh, turnout is an incredibly important thing in election campaigns. Obviously, if people don't turn out to vote, you can't win if they don't turn out to vote for you. And as we were tracking into the campaign, one other thing that everybody was noting at the time was the lack of enthusiasm about any of the political choices. Nobody was excited about anything. And the potential was that we were going to have a very low turnout election. Uh, and what ended up happening was he actually ended up with a pretty high turnout election. Uh, the Liberals, uh, um, in particular, were able to, through the way they ran their campaign, particularly at the very end, they were able to push up turnout beyond those low expectations and uh, second only to the 2015 election this century. So since 2000, in terms of turnout, they were at 66 in terms of overall, uh, in terms of overall performance. Uh, so the election results. This is 2015. Now the important thing to note on this slide is how the Liberals won their majority in 2015. They didn't do very well in the West, although they did well in British Columbia. The reason they won in 2015 was basically because of Quebec and Ontario. Now the number of seats in Ontario is really important because that's where the Conservatives thought that they were going to make their gains. The Liberals won 80 seats in the province of Ontario in 2015. They also won in terms of national vote in the last election campaign, around 40. Here's what happened this time. The Conservatives actually won the popular vote, 34 to 33. They won by a point. The NDP collapsed. They're now back to where they used to perform in the 1980s. The Green Party did what the Green Party does, which is nothing. Uh, and the Bloc Québécois had a steady rise over the space of the last, uh, th through the course of the, the election campaign. And the People's Party uh, ended up being a damp squib, didn't elect anybody, and only got about 2% of the popular vote. Here's what you need to know. <laughs> Take a look at Ontario. The Liberals won 80 seats in 2015, they won 79 this time. That's why they won the election. Wiped out in Alberta, wiped out pretty much in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Conservatives got 17 seats in British Columbia this time. The Liberals lost six and they were down to 11. Atlantic Canada, the Conservatives, the NDP and the Green, all won parties, where the Liberals swept the last time. But the reason that the, Liberal, the Liberals formed the government today is because of their performance in Ontario where they did not lose like they lost every other place. They only lost one seat. By gender, if this was an election that was only men voting, the Conservatives would have won a majority. So something about the Conservative message and the Liberal message was differential among men and women. Something that the Conservatives were doing, and I'll let you think about it, <laughs> uh, obviously uh, hurt them dramatically with female voters. <coughs> the Liberals did much better among female voters. Actually, among younger women voters, the NDP tended to do pretty well. So the Tories have had, in this election campaign, a gender issue, which, by the way, in 2011, Stephen Harper did not have. By age, and this is, by the way, this is our exit poll. So we interviewed 12,000 people on election day who had actually voted. So this isn't just general public opinion. This is people who actually voted. The Tories have a generational problem. If they had just had people 55 years of age or older went voting, they would have won the election. But unfortunately, we let the youngsters vote, and uh, the Liberals did a little better among them. Not overwhelmingly, though, not hugely. But because the Conservatives did not maintain that slight lead that they had among older voters with younger voters, they uh, were unable to deliver uh, a, a victory on Election Day. Actually, it's interesting to me when you take a look at these data, how well the NDP did among millennials. So this is a reflection of the fact that people who were 
younger voters were actually quite disillusioned with Justin Trudeau. And we're looking at Jagmeet Singh. They want to believe, right? And he had the enthusiastic campaign uh, going into the tail end. Even though he wasn't able to actually deliver uh, very much in terms of seats, uh, he certainly built momentum from where he started the, the beginning of the campaign. When did you decide to vote? Half of people we interviewed on election day said that they voted, uh, half of them, that, that they uh, decided how to vote before the campaign had even started. Before the debates, another 13. Shortly after the debates, about 16. Late deciders, there was a lot of late movement. Almost a quarter of voters said they made up their mind in the last week of the campaign. 7% made up their mind in the voting booth. By the way, fairly typical. This isn't new, this is fairly typical. And when you take a look at the parties and how their voters came into voting, um, conservatives overwhelmingly made up their mind at the start and didn't really move through the course of the election campaign. So the, the conservatives were not able to build any momentum and were not able to get people to change their minds for them through the course of the election campaign. The Liberals, on the other hand, 24% of the Liberal vote, a quarter of the Liberal vote made up their minds in the last week. And I would argue if they would have held the election a week earlier, the Conservatives probably won, would have won the minority. So the Liberal Party won the election in the last week of the campaign, and they principally won it in the province of Ontario. Would you say you voted today for the leader, for the party, for the local candidates? Mostly people say that they were voting on the issues, followed by the leaders. Sorry, local candidates. I know there's some local candidates here. You, particularly in cities, you don't really matter as much as you think you do. It's because people just really don't know who the candidates are. If you live in more rural areas, it's a different, uh, it's a different story. But um, this was a campaign that was driven to a certain extent by issues and leaders. Actually, I, I would say the, mo the, the biggest uh, uh, variable in the campaign was leadership. What were the most important issues? Health care was number one, although it didn't really drive voting. Climate change moved up through the course of the campaign and became number two. It also didn't really drive voting in a positive way. It actually drove it in a negative way. And I'll talk about that in just a second. The economy was number three. Didn't really drive a lot of voting um, and changing of votes. Taxes, availability, uh, or affordability and cost of living, which I thought were going to be much bigger issues, ended up not being that, that, that big in terms of deciding the election campaign. This is a noisy chart, but it sums up everything for me, <laughs> the entire campaign. This and the late deciding sums up everything. So every other party, so climate change for the Greens, climate change for the Bloc Québécois, Climate change for the Liberals. Climate change doesn't even re register in the top five for Conservatives. So we asked people, what are the three biggest, uh, uh, top three issues out of the list of, I think, 20 for you in terms of how you're going to vote? Conservatives, climate change did not matter at all. The problem on climate change was, who would you vote for if you cared most about it? And the answer is, about three parties. If the election was actually about climate change, the Greens would have won because they were seen as being far ahead of any of the other parties and being the most important, uh, of doing the best job of delivering on climate change. So climate change, inter interestingly enough, became almost like healthcare usually is an election campaign. You can't win on it, but you can lose on it by screwing it up. And the Conservatives did not have an answer on climate. Not a big deal in Alberta, but a big deal in Ontario. Top voting issues by age, younger voters most on climate change, but all you can see all three groups of voters, climate change was either one or two. So not having an answer on that issue was a disadvantage for the Conservatives in the election campaign. As I've said on the climate change issue many, many, many times, people, 80% of the population is concerned about it, 80% of the population believes that climate change is uh, uh, generated by human activity. Almost nobody knows what to do about it, and nobody wants to pay anything for it. 
So what they're looking for is at least kind of a philosophical commitment to do something, and the Conservatives could not muster that. What goes in the climate change solution box? Nobody cares. You notice that the, the Liberals during the election campaign did not talk about a carbon tax. They talked about their plan on carbon. They didn't talk about a carbon tax because they know that a carbon tax, even in the province of Ontario, is not popular. In fact, if there's one issue that uh, Doug Ford has managed reasonably well during the course of the, his year and a half in government, and you know this is Rod Phillips, I think why he ended up being Minister of Finance because he was the one who did it, was that they actually beat back the Liberals on the carbon tax in Ontario. Uh, they probably won the battle here in the province because in the suburbs, you can't talk about the carbon tax. Remember, 90% of the population growth in Canada is in car commuting communities. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a really big issue for people, and cost of living is a really big issue for people. But on the carbon tax, uh, the government of Ontario was at least able to put something up that looked like they had a plan and a set of alternatives, whereas the federal Conservative Party never did. He stood up and he said something, but even he didn't look like he believed it. And that was a big problem during the course of the campaign. So like health care, you only get into trouble when you don't look like you care about it. Or you're going to privatize it. Or you're going to do something different. Same thing with carbon. You have to say that you're, you're, you have a plan, and it has to be a credible plan, and you have to be prepared to stand behind it if you're going to win in the province of Ontario. Full stop. Factors impacting vote choice, the debate around climate change, 40% of the population said it had an effect on how they voted. But as I said in the more detailed analysis here, if it was about climate change, the Greens would have won, and they didn't. Debates around secularism played a major role. About one in five voters said that it did. I would say it probably dug in more on the Conservatives than anybody else. And finally, uh, my religious beliefs, 13% of uh, Canadian voters say that the religious beliefs played a role in how they voted in the election campaign. You don't win any election campaign with 13%. Having Doug Ford as Premier, and this was just in Ontario, had an impact on how I voted in the election. 56% of Ontarians, 63% of people in the GTA. So obviously Ford had an impact on this campaign and it was not good for the Conservatives and Andrew Scheer. And the reason was because Scheer was in, un, incapable of defining himself effectively as he went through the campaign. So what the Liberals did was very clever. They basically said, ignore this guy, focus on Doug Ford. Because all he is is a proxy for the other guy. So if you've got an opinion about a Conservative and what the Conservative brand means, focus on Doug Ford. And it hurt Scheer because he was incapable of being able to establish himself as a credible person standing on his own outside of that branding. By the way, everybody who worked on the Conservative campaign probably knew this, but they couldn't figure out a way to deal with it. Now, Doug Ford did go into hiding for the election campaign, went into witness protection, um, but by the same token, uh, you know, even him not being in the game didn't help. Now, there are some people who will make the argument that Doug Ford out campaigning on behalf of Andrew Scheer would have made a big difference, positive difference for Andrew Scheer. I would doubt that very much. This idea that there is this thing called Ford Nation is a myth. It doesn't really exist. They've, what creates the Ford momentum, and did it for his brother too, was an opponent that people really didn't like and which he represented the logical alternative to. Same thing that, uh, that uh, Doug Ford did with Kathleen Wynne. Were people really voting on the qualities of Doug Ford and his policy ideas? No. They wanted change and he most looked like change. The same way that, that uh, Justin Trudeau did in 2015. So the problem for Andrew Scheer was when you're up against the power, when you, you're incapable of defining yourself, people default to something that is kind of a proxy and they use that to define you and that's exactly what the Liberals did to them. Oh, this is one of my favorite slides. This is from the exit poll. Specific emotions felt post-election. So uh, I would say if I had asked this question after 2015, and I wish I had, 
uh, at the top of the list would have been enthusiastic, happy, and hopeful. Now, worried, disappointed, sad, betrayed, angry. At the top of the list, worried and disappointed. So this is the balance of positive and negative emotions uh, that people feel on a regional basis. At a national level, 47% to 37% feeling positive or negative over positive. And you don't even want to know what it is in Saskatchewan and Alberta. But also in British Columbia and in Atlantic Canada, the only people who seem to be satisfied with what happened in the election campaign, or at least somewhat sanguine with what happened in the election pan campaign, are people who live in Quebec and Ontario. Everybody else has a problem. So election 2019, what happened? Let me quickly build this slide. The Conservatives couldn't take the 905 and they lost as a result. Well, one person took the 905, she's sitting over there, <laughs> for the Conservatives. And I remember saying at the uh, last time I was here, if you didn't win your seat, they were done. <laughs> so they at least had a chance because you did, so well done. Um, the Ford government affected the vote in Ontario. It is undeniable. It's all over the data. Next, climate change mattered, but not because people voted for a carbon plan. They voted against the people, who, the party that didn't have one. As I said, they didn't even look like they believed it themselves. Andrew Scheer did not cut through. No doubt didn't have a national vision that, uh, that appealed to enough voters in all regions. And one in five liberals and conservative voters held their nose and they voted against something rather than for something. So what's next? Just wanna make sure there are no sharp objects on any tables. Uh, and there's lots of alcohol available. Okay, so this is something we run called the disruption barometer. I think I might have showed this last time around. Uh, but what it is is a correlation, a collection, it's an ind index of how people are feeling about their own personal lives, what they feel about the country, what's happening in the country, economically and politically. And there's a line that's right in the middle there where it's this historical norm that if countries are above that, what tends to happen is you don't have disruptive elections. So for example, uh, the UK, the, uh, the uh, red line here was down near the bottom of the chart, potential for a disruptive election in, in the UK, because we run this all over the world. Uh, in Canada, definitely below the line. I would describe what we just had as a disruptive election. So I think this does a pretty good job of explaining it. Are people, has people, uh, has their optimism improved? No. Justin Trudeau has gone from probably the longest honeymoon in Canadian history to one of the shortest. People aren't happy. The future does not look bright. This is better or worse compared to 2017. Your personal financial situation is going to improve or worsen over the next 15 years. Your overall quality of life in 10 years and the prospects of Canada over the next 10 years. All of them are more negative today than they were in 2017. Satisfaction with how things are going in Canada, people are, you know, dissatisfied. 58% compared to 42% who say they're satisfied. Are we on the right track or the wrong track? 58% say we're on the wrong track, 42% say we're on the right track. Compare that back to the election back in 2015 when right track, wrong track, 57% thought we were on the right track, peaked a year after at 58%. Trudeau government's approval. And this is on the exit poll. It bounced up a little bit from 42 to 43. Insignificant, obviously, statistically uh, within the margin of error. But people are not, they're not feeling enthusiastic about what resulted as a, as a, from, from the election. Now this is, remember we talked about messages and mandates and alignment with issues? This is what the public says they want the government to focus on. The, go uh, the economy should be the next government's top priority. Do you get the sense that that's what they're going to be doing out of Ottawa? John Ibbotson, one of my 
um, a co-author I've written a couple of books with, wrote a really good column in the Globe and Mail uh, this week in which he talked about uh, return to 1972. And I have a sense that that's where we're headed. Big national programs, because these guys love them. Deficit, who cares? Taxes going up, particularly if you're affluent. Healthcare should be a top priority, affordable housing, cost of living, uniting Canada. So how are we on the economy in uniting Canada? I think it's important that the government maintain a balanced budget, says 80% of Canadians. When government gets involved in the economy, it usually does more harm than good, says 40% of Canadians. I'm worried about losing my job, says 14% of us, which actually is down. It's, I've seen it as high as 25. But where were we really in trouble? Views on national unity by province. I feel atta more attached to my province than I do to Canada. Alberta, 52%. Quebec, 55%. Atlantic Canada, 53%. Generally driven by Newfoundland. Alberta and Saskatchewan have had good, uh, good, have good reason to be mad about how they're being treated by the federal government. Oh yeah, do they feel that in Saskatchewan and Alberta. 76% in Saskatchewan, 79% or 79% in Saskatchewan, 76% in Alberta, but really nobody else feels that they're justified in feeling that way. Especially, by the way, the province of Quebec. It's only 32. Canada is more divided than ever so there's a majority in every single region of the country, especially in Alberta and Saskatchewan, but also Atlantic Canada, 66%. My province would be better off if it's separated from Canada. I've been doing this for, Dennis, you and I, how long ago? I've been doing this for 30 years. I have never seen Alberta ahead of Quebec on separation. Ever. A third of people in the province of British Columbia, and that, or Alberta, and that's the strong question. A quarter of people in Saskatchewan, which is the same as the province of Quebec. I feel less committed to Canada than I did a few years ago. 42% of people in Saskatchewan, 38% in Alberta, which means they're not prepared to give up yet. But they're angry. I think the views of my province are adequately represented in Canada, says only Ontario. Why? Because Ontario thinks it is the country. That's why Queen's Park going after Ottawa never really works. Because it's like you're punching yourself in the face. Never really works. My province does not get its fair share from Confederation. Quebec used to talk this list. Now Alberta and Saskatchewan do. Individual provinces should have the right to, protect, to reject new energy projects. They do not believe is in their, in, their, in their interest. Half of us think that. So how are we ever going to build a national pipeline? Good question. We need an electoral reform in Canada so that we are no longer uh, have the first past the post system. As bad as people feel in various parts of the country, you can only get half of Canadians saying that we should, which is the problem that the Liberals faced in the last Parliament. It's not like people are really excited about the idea of electoral reform. The federal government should not get involved with Quebec's Bill C-21. 40% of us agree with that. So uh, uh, actually 60% think the federal government should. And the federal government's been ignoring it. Canada's program of equalization payments is unfair to my province, says almost 40% of Canadians. And we look at the, all of this on a regional basis. The federal government should not get involved in Bill C-21, says 54% of Quebecers. So I don't know how you do that one. Canada's program of equalization payments is unfair to my province, says 71% of Albertans and 68% of people in the province of Saskatchewan. Although, by the way, in Quebec, they're quite happy with it. Individual provinces should have the right to reject new energy projects they do not believe are in their interest, says 52% of people in British Columbia. 
which is why we have a problem with TMX. But by the way, majority is in every single province. So actually, Andrew Scheer's idea on an energy corridor should probably be a top priority for any government, leaving us, because you're going to be just fighting this forever. And finally, we need electoral reform in Canada, says the people who voted against the government uh, in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Other people are sort of interested in looking at it, but you can't really do anything with 50%. So my key takeaways from the election, the market tells you what works. 90% of the Canadian population growth over the space of the last 20 years has been in car commuting communities, and the Conservatives could not find a way to win with them. They did in 2011 have not been able to in two national elections since. Liberals understand the demographic change and knew it was enough if they held on to Quebec and they won in the 905 to win the election. So they did. The way overestimation of the importance of the People's Party of Canada. We're not on a populist track in Canada at the moment. And unfortunately for the NDP, they've gone back to being a party of the 1980s. The bloc is back, but it's not about the national project anymore. It's about the nativist project. And it's about protecting their values in the province of Quebec inside Canada. It's not about setting up a separate, uh, separate state anymore. As I showed you before, uh, the likelihood of a, of a uh, separation vote is higher in Alberta now than it is in uh, Quebec, which I thought I'd never see. The Liberals have a very strong minority government. Uh, they have a dance partner for just about anything they want to do. They don't need two parties to govern, to work with them, they only need one, and they'll be able to find one on just about every issue. Uh, I would argue that uh, the election was more of a, a message than it was a mandate this time around. I still think the, the Liberals suffer from an issues alignment, the big issues uh, question uh, with, uh, with the national agenda. Uh, what they were able to do, though, was to send a very strong message to the, type, to the Conservative Party about uh, the problems that they have with their leadership. Expect to return, as I said before, to the 1970s, big deficits in national programs because, my God, do the Laurentian elite ever love national projects. So I expect national pharmacare, I don't know, national whatevers, I mean transit. You know, we're going to see all sorts of money spill out of Ottawa uh, for national projects. Uh, the Liberals are able to undercut the NDP and consolidate the progressive vote in Canada to the extent they needed to in order to win the election. The NDP's got big trouble going forward. Actually, I think the bigger challenge for the, ND, for the Liberal Party going uh, over the next three years will not be uh, finding a way to govern, it will be finding a way to get defeated. This is the problem that Stephen Harper had in 2008. And the reason is because every time the government looks like it's doing reasonably well in terms of public opinion, that means the other parties aren't, so they won't defeat them. And when the opposition parties are doing well, not all of them are doing well at the same time, so there's always an incentive for one of them to vote for the government. It's actually quite hard to get defeated. I think Harper back in, uh, in uh, 2015 could not believe that uh, Michael Ignatiev defeated him because it made no sense. He was, way, he was in third place in the polls and he defeated him anyway. Oh, go figure. Maybe somebody will do something like that this time around, but I don't see it. Uh, for the Conservatives, my Conservative friends, I would say the following. You cannot win a national election based on Western grievance and social conservatism. You can't win. The risk that the Conservatives face right now is that they will become the Reform Party again. In order to win, and I said this at the last, and I'm going to add one more word to this, I said this at the last presentation I gave, a Conservative leader does not need to be inspirational. Conservative voters are not hopey, changey type people. They actually don't like government, they don't like politicians very much. Justin Trudeau would not work for conservatives. They don't not want that type of leader. They want a leader that is competent, confident, and dignified. And the other word I would add to this, and I've got it in caps here, contemporary. Same-sex marriage in Canada is settled. Abortion in Canada is settled. Religion and the state do not mix. This is not in the United States. It doesn't matter what your personal beliefs are. 
if you can't communicate clearly how you would govern according to those conditions, you cannot win in this province. And if you cannot win in this province, you cannot win a national election. Full stop. So Andrew Scheer has to figure out a way to be competent, confident, dignified, and contemporary, or he will lose again. And are we about to slide into, when those of you who are old enough to remember this, you remember this, and probably there was a book that was written back in the 1970s. Uh, actually, was it written by Dalton Camp? I'm trying to remember who wrote it, called The Tory Syndrome. And this was the conservatives all through the 1960s and 70s stabbing their leaders in the back and losing to the Liberals are, as a result. Are we about to slide into that again? That's the one variable in here that we just don't know. So far in the short term, it looks like Andrew Scheer has been able to hold on to his caucus. You're all hearing the rumblings. I'm hearing all the rumblings. I'm sure everybody is. Between now and April, we'll see uh, when they have the next uh, national party uh, convention whether or not he's able to uh, quell some of the uh, vibrations that are negative. Um, about his ongoing leadership, we'll see. It'll be a, a challenge for him. But ultimately, what he has to do, if he's able to get pa past all of this, is he has to deal with the last word in this phrase, which is contemporary. Is he able to communicate a contemporary, modern version of what he, being a Canadian Conservative is? And if he cannot, he will lose again. We all happy? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, as you can see, hands are flying up. Okay. Ma'am? Um, I noticed that in the last week there was that upset. Okay. And I'm guessing for the rest of the South Carolina State, do you think Obama's endorsed the Constitution? Zero to none. Can you repeat the question, please? The liberals love, and I, they all think that they're members of the cast of the West Wing. Right? They all want to run around and talk about what brilliant strategic geniuses they are. And by the way, they were in this campaign, uh, the Liberal Party. So uh, one of the things that they engineered, because this group of Liberals is incredibly close to the Barack Obama uh, administration, the people around Barack Obama. Uh, so they're claiming, and John Iveson, I don't know, maybe he ran into one of them at the, uh, the Metro in, uh, in Ottawa, and somebody spun him the line that uh, uh, Barack Obama's endorsement made the difference in the campaign. No, we were in field. We were watching it in social media. It lasted an afternoon and it went away. Uh, the reason that the Liberals won the election campaign is they out-organized and out-campaigned the Conservatives in the 905 in this province. That's why they won. Barack Obama was not on the ticket. Sir? Uh, I might have lost self-interest to the clubs here. Uh, 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 military matters. There was an announcement for the election here about uh, You know how I had, I had that list of the issues that people care about? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's down here. Sure. Yeah. Now, Canadians, the, the foreign policy doesn't generally matter in, in Canadian election campaigns, and uh, unless you really do something stupid. And uh, uh, military issues tend not to. I mean, the Bullmark missile back in the early 1960s, but, but uh, tend not to matter that much. People do care deeply about veterans, and um, what it can do is suggest kind of a caustic, out of touch perspective uh, by a government that's not taking care of people who uh, the public feel should be um, taken care of because of the service that they've given to the country. But among all the types of issues that the media is going to talk about and all the things that are really getting a lot of attention in the election campaign, um, it tends not to be a big driver of, uh, of, of votes, but it doesn't mean that people don't care about it. Uh, I I fear that unless the Conservative Party returns to the old progressive conservative model of progression on social issues and on fiscal issues being very conservative, we're never going to win. And do you think that Sheer could ever communicate that kind of progressive approach? Because I, I could never believe anything he said during the 
Um, let me just say uh, there's there's a two breeds of, of uh, political characters in Canada that we tend to uh, remember with great nostalgia. One of them is the Blue Liberal, and the other one is the Red Tory. Uh, they are both unicorns. They really don't exist any, anymore as a significant voting bloc in the Canadian population. Uh, anything what's happened, and this is a global phenomenon, it's not just a Canadian phenomenon. We always talk about the growth of the extremes. The real thing that's happening around the world in terms of politics is the decline of the governing consensus in the middle. So that idea that you could be um, uh, a, uh, a Hugh Siegel type of conservative, those conservatives don't win anywhere anymore. They, 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 th that idea of the old, uh, uh, you want to say socially progressive, but they were also economically progressive. There was not a lot of difference between Brian Mulroney and, and Paul Martin. I mean, they were basically, the, that, that, they were the governing consensus. All they did was wore different shirts. One would wore red, one wore blue. What happened through the course of the 1990s and particularly because of the changing population patterns in the country and the growth of power in Western Canada, is that that changed. And we now have progressive voters and we now have conservative voters. But being a conservative voter does not mean being a socially conservative voter. You can actually have quite strong views on a whole bunch of foreign policy issues or, or on mostly economic issues, the size of government, um, all sorts of things that are people would generally see as being conservative, but not contest the issues that are already settled in the country, uh, and mostly on social policy. So I, I kind of reject the idea that describing somebody as like a fiscal conservative and then uh, socially liberal was really what that old red Tory was, because they weren't really that either. Uh, both, both groups, the, the liberals and conservatives, were fairly close on the ideological scale. They moved further apart. Andrew Scheer's challenge was that he could not communicate in an effective way how he would govern given the realities of where Canadian values are. And Canadian values are very clear on women's rights. They're very clear on things like uh, uh, identity, any issues that have to deal with identity. They're very, very clear on LGBTQ2, whatever the, how long it is these days. We add new letters all the time. Um, uh, those issues are settled. And that we're actually deb debating them in an election campaign means that he could not sell. He could not communicate to Canadians how he would not be a threat. And that's how all of these things rolled up together, where it wasn't just um, they saw him as a threat to women's, uh, women's access to abortion. People really don't think that that's being challenged in any significant way, or really even thought that he might. But there was enough suspicion about who he was and what he stood for that when you raised it, people thought, oh, yeah, that kind of seems seems kind of odd. And then you roll in, uh, you know, uh, what not marching in a gay pride march or whatever. Whether you should or you shouldn't, I, you know, personal choice. But the fact that he was so uncertain on the first one made the second one even a little bit worse. I mean, what else is he not not going to do? What else is he standing for? What is he? What else does he believe? And then you roll in the whole climate change thing, and it's like, hold on, a lot of these things we we really care about in Canada. Are you telling me this guy's going to go in another direction? That seems a little strange for me. I'm suspicious. I don't know who he is. Maybe he's another Doug Ford. And right now in the electoral cycle in the province of Ontario, where they are and the tough decisions they have to make, uh, um, there's no conservative who's really going to be popular in the province of Ontario. They're going to vote to take on the teachers. They're doing all sorts of things that people regard as negative that they voted for. But they're in the bad place in their electoral cycle. So the conservative brand is going to is going to suffer. And Andrew Scheer walked right into that, was not able to define himself. They were able to throw this mud at him, in which he just said, here, give me more, and put more mud on himself, and walked into election day with too much suspicion. And because he wasn't able to define himself, he got defined. Uh, well, you know, it would be interesting over the space of the next two years to see whether he can. And there is, uh, you know, in, in my view, two years is a lifetime in politics, but people have to learn lessons from their defeat, defeats. I lived through exactly the same thing at the, after the 2004 election campaign with Stephen Harper, who got beat the same way. He got beat the same way. Harper went away for, what, six months? Sat down, said, I really, wanted, I really want this job, and there's a few things that I have to do in order to get it. 
and he went back and he did it. So I'm, I don't. I think it was the first day of the campaign. He stood up at the podium and, was, and he gave made the first thing in the election campaign. He announced his position on abortion. He took care of it right from day one. He had a clear answer. He gave it every time. Sheer sure didn't do that. Hum, ha, uh, personal choice. What do you really believe? Uh, it, it just didn't work. And and at the end of it, I don't have to say good, bad, and different. The market decides, and the market decides. It's a cruel game. Dennis McIntosh with CTV are you, News. Are you saying that cultural and racial issues didn't make a big difference? I think suspicious about what his suspicions about his personal beliefs, uh, the leader of the opposition, his personal beliefs, and his inability to reassure people on all of these things did matter in the election campaign. And and uh, this was all again a reflection of the fact that he, he didn't really define himself going in. I th it, it looked to me through the election campaign that they thought that they could back in based on the other guy's unpopularity and mistakes, so didn't really do anything to kind of shake things up. And even, it got even worse when the Trudeau blackface issue happened because then it looked like you didn't really have to. Uh, but that didn't have the impact that people thought. And the reason why was because people never thought Justin Trudeau was a bigot. They thought he was immature. They thought he was a bit goofy. Um, they, they never really thought much of his leadership, but did they think he was a bigot? No. That's the difference between being defined and not being defined. Anyway, one last question and we'll wrap it up. Oh, can, madam, uh, you were faster off the drop. Did that tip the female vote to the liberals, all this discussion we just had? Yeah, the uncertainty and I would say also uh, concern about Doug Ford and the suburbs, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, last question, you're insisting. All right, one more. <laughs> Sir, fire away. How would a shift of provincial politics on the challenge of the dollar authority into the federal leadership of the Conservative Party change this political policy? Uh, it would be a very interesting change, but we she had her chance in the provincial leadership process and didn't really do that well. Um, so it takes more than just meeting the conditions of a CV. You actually have to be able to organize the party. You actually have to be able to organize the knocking off of the leader. <laughs> have to be able have to organize all of those things. And I don't. I haven't seen uh, that she's got that kind of uh, game. Oh yeah, rel relentless, no doubt. Um, relentless, and, and I worked for him, so I know just how relentless. And, and, uh, uh, no, I, I actually think that uh, um, that there is some possibility somebody could organize against Andrew Shear, but all of this ta all of this takes real effort, and uh, somebody has to put their hand up, and it's, it moves beyond criticism. You actually have to have an heir apparent. You have to have somebody who's going to do it, like Paul Martin, you know, was prepared to do it. And I haven't seen anybody who's prepared to stick up his hand and, or her hand and, uh, and do that. Um, we'll go through the Christmas season. We'll see if anybody goes home and reconsiders. Uh, uh, but uh, at, at this stage of the game, it doesn't really look like it. Um, but you never know. Thank you very much. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.